Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Cabot. How's everybody doing tonight? This is so amazing to see everybody here tonight. This event was kind of like I was at the Beverly Farmers Market one day buying fish, and Wayne Miller grabbed me by the collar and introduced me to Dean Berg, and that's why we're here tonight. Uh, how cool is that? That 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 that. We had our humble beginnings at the Farmer's Market in, in Beverly. Um, before we get started with uh, tonight, just a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, we do have emergency exits to my left and right on both the orchestra level um, and also up in the balcony and also out the uh, lobby where you came in. Um, I am told that if you have not yet gotten a meal, uh, that we do still have meals in the back uh, and you're welcome to uh, partake in that. Uh, we're so, so glad to have all this great food here tonight. So. And thank you all for being here. There's going to be a lot of people to thank tonight, and uh, uh, we will get to that portion of the show. Um, so the Cabot and Green Beverly, besides Wayne and I's meeting at the farmer's market, this is something that we've been pretty serious about for the last couple of years. Uh, we started through by implementing composting at the theater a couple of years ago. We got rid of our plastic cups. Every, every beer cup, everything is compostable. Uh, and, and we're putting together our plan to uh, completely get rid of single-use plastic bottles at this theater in the next couple of months. Uh, we're just trying to figure out the best way to do that, but it is coming, and we're really, really excited about that. Um, so lots of things happening at the theater. You know, when I learned that we were uh, using 12,000 water bottles a year, I said, we got to do something about that. You know, we're, we're here to benefit the community and by putting all that trash back out there that, you know, we're, we're not doing our job the best that we can. So, uh, so we're working on that and we're excited to be here tonight. Um, I, I do have a special thanks to uh, our sponsor for Community Conversations. This series started um, last June. Um, we've been having it on a monthly basis, um, and it's just been wonderful the way that it's built. We've met so many new friends, so many community partners, uh, and I want to give a special thanks to Salem Five Bank, who is the sponsor of our series here. Um, and from Salem Five Bank, I want to introduce Brad Hunt. Uh, Brad has been with the bank for almost 17 years. Some of you may remember Brad uh, when he was uh, the Beverly manager for almost 10 years, and then he went on to work in the Danvers branch of Salem Five. Uh, Brad has recently returned to Beverly as the branch manager, and he's excited to get back to his community roots here. Since we have last seen Brad, he has had great success personally. He got married, started a family, and professionally, he's a member of the Rotary, the Danvers YMCA, and an ambassador to the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce. He's a great community guy. Please give it up for Brad Hunt. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Um Thanks for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I'm thrilled to be back in Beverly where I feel like it was my home for so many years working at Salem Five. And I guess I would just say that I guess that's what it means to me to be in this community working for a community bank like Salem Five. There's a lot of words I've heard tonight. Uh, community, participation, collaboration, teamwork, um, partnership. And all of those things kind of embody what it means to me to be part of this community in general, um, but more importantly, uh, to work at a bank like Salem Five that can help facilitate uh, something as great as this event, as this series, um, this space to be in, um, and this space as in Beverly as a whole. So um, I'm not going to take any more time, but just thank you for being here and being active. And um, consider me as someone, if I can help any cause like this uh, from the banking perspective or from the community, I'm eager to help and uh, help build that team of collective work together. And thanks again, and I uh, look forward to a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brad, and thank you, Casey, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd like to just give it a quick applause to Wooden Bone and our dear friend Jesse and Joe. I don't know how we got lucky enough to have their, uh, their vocals and sound tonight, but we're lucky, so here we are. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm Julia. 
and we are she, her pronouns, and we're both from Green Beverly, and we're thrilled you're here with us tonight. Thank you so much for being here. We've got a really fun, fulfilling, and forward-thinking talk about water, where it comes from, where it goes, and how our choices as individuals within our community affect its quality and its quantity. Tonight's program honors the relationship between land and water in the coastal region we occupy. For this reason and for many others, it's appropriate to recognize that we are part of a long line of inhabitants who have been nurtured by it. A local person with native tribal blood helped create the following land acknowledgement that we're honored to share with you. As we gather here in this place, we acknowledge and honor the original indigenous inhabitants of this land, the Namkeg and Pawtucket bands of the Massachusetts Tribal Nation, which continues today through the membership of the Massachusetts Tribe. We acknowledge their ancestral and continued connection to the land. We also recognize our obligations to this land to offer better environmental care and stewardship to which the indigenous people who care for it have long called us. As we work toward diversity, equity, and inclusion, we acknowledge the importance of lifting up and inviting in many voices, including those of indigenous people, and including those voices and perspectives in our discourse, in our decision-making, and in our actions. Thank you. Now we want to welcome you to Coastal Communities Talk Water. Thank you for being here, and thanks for being a part of this conversation, or at least we're going to call upon you shortly to be a part of the conversation. Um, this series ha was founded by the Cabot Theater and Leading Ladies. Leading Ladies is a local organization dedicated to educating our community about issues of social and environmental justice. Would any members of Leading Ladies in the audience actually stand up and give a wave to our, our group here? We'd love to celebrate you. Thank you so much, ladies. We are really grateful for the important work that these women and the people who are part of their organization do for our community. In the spirit of their great work, we'd like to invite each of you to vote for conscientious representatives and share these values. The right people in office will make a difference, so vote. Um, <laughs> any elected officials in the house, if you don't mind standing up now, if there is anybody here, we'd love to also celebrate you and drive people to ask you questions afterwards. Next time. Next time, thank you. <laughs> I think there's a mayoral meeting right now, actually, so <laughs> that makes sense. Tonight, Green Beverly and our partner organizations are here in the spirit of strengthening, strengthening our ability to connect with one another. We believe in creating opportunities that reduce barriers and span cultural, socioeconomic, and racial lines to achieve shared goals. We believe that together, we can make big waves. <laughs> We're funny, clearly, as we read off our scripts. Uh, as the foundation of life, water connects us to one another and to the earth. Abundant, accessible, clean water is not to be taken for granted. Thanks to the collaborative efforts of Salem Sound Coast Watch, Ipswich River Watershed Association, Sustainable Marblehead, and Green Beverly, we will hear three brilliant local minds share about what makes water so precious, how it unites and divides us, and tangible ways you can help protect this life-giving gift, water. Would you please stand and wave if you're an employee or volunteer of our collaborating organizations, Salem Sound Coast Watch, Sustainable Marblehead, Ipswich River Watershed Association, or Green Beverly? It's a lot of people. Thank you. Many of you tonight. Thank you. You'll see a few of those folks again on stage when it's time for the Q&A community conversations part later on. Thank you for all you do for our communities. You may take your seats. We will soon begin the presentation portion of the evening. Please hold your questions until after all presenters have finished. When we hold the community conversation portion, that'll be the time to ask your questions. Thank you. 
And I'm just thinking if there are any children in the audience that would like to touch really amazing sea creatures and or enjoy some children's meals and other activities, Salem Sound Coast Watch, if you're not aware of it, has some great activities in the side room. You're also invited to stay here if that's your jam. <laughs> so that all said, without further ado, we would like to welcome our first speaker, Steve Wolf. Steve is here on behalf of Sustainable Marblehead and has experience with the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, and he'll give us a broad understanding of the watersheds of northeastern Massachusetts and what protections are in place to keep them viable. So let's welcome Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thanks so much, Jen. Well, hi, folks. It's great to be here tonight, and it's really good to see so many faces who are interested in, in our water systems here, where our water comes from and where it ends up. Um, I'm going to start off with just a couple of shots from our local community because I think it probably engenders some of the reasons why we chose to live in these coastal communities. The loon you see up here is um, just off the ferry pier uh, in Salem. I think it's a, a, a regular there. Um, this is a recent sunset over on the Marblehead side uh, looking across Salem Harbor. And this is some activity right under the town pier here in Beverly, probably what it looks like now or a couple hours ago. Um, and I think it's natural for folks to feel relaxed, maybe engaged a bit when you see some of these photos that include water because water is such an essential part of sort of who we are. I mean, it's, it's literally two thirds of our bodies are water. We spend our first nine months living in water. And it's an essential part of pretty much everything, how we grow and um, gather our food, our manufacturing, our recreation. And it, we're very fortunate here in New England and really in a lot of the country that when we go and turn on the tap, we're pretty certain what's gonna come out is potable, good, clean water and with enough volume for us, we don't really question that. And when that water goes down the drain, we don't really have to worry about where it ends up. And so what I hope to do here in this first talk is give you a little bit of general background, make sure that we're all sort of on the same page, and then the next two speakers will really bring it home a lot closer here to our communities in terms of things that you can do to help protect the resources that I think you guys are here because, because you value. So with that, we'll start off with a little bit of a review about our sources of potable water. I think what comes to mind generally is a lake, a river, a surface water. And for those of us in these three communities represented here tonight in Beverly, Salem, and Marblehead, we all get our water from surface water, but from different sources. But there are a lot of other potentials that are used both here in this country and then around the world, certainly groundwater, there are a lot of parts of the world where collecting rainwater is still a very viable opportunity. Um, and then we move into more of the high tech arena where um, desalinization, actually extracting fresh water from salt water. And I'm aware of at least one location here in Massachusetts where that's actually performed. Um, and then to so go in the furthest distance, which is full recycling of water. If you're up on the space station, or really there are some countries that are very limited in terms of their water, and they totally recycle wastewater back into potable drinking water. It's very doable technologically, but it requires a lot of energy. But again, given that we're here in, in um, coastal Massachusetts and rely on surface water, we're gonna focus on that. And there's one term that it's good for you to have a, a, an understanding of the definition, and that's um, a watershed. Um, and there's a simple definition up here, but what I like to think of it as if you built a model of a particular area, incorporating all the terrain, the hills, the valleys, the streams, and you put a marble anywhere in that watershed, it's always gonna roll down to the same place, be that exiting into a river, a lake, or the ocean. And if you put that marble a little too far and it rolls down in a different direction, that's a separate watershed. So you're gonna hear that term more tonight as it applies to, to our various communities. Taking that definition and looking at the state of Massachusetts, um, it's divided into 28 different watersheds, major watersheds across the state. 
we're in what's called the North Coastal Watershed, where the Red Star is, up in the upper right corner. And really, all that strip of communities from north of Boston along the coastline, we really don't have enough distance. The water, the, the precipitation that falls on our, on, on our area drains directly into the coastal waters. It really doesn't have time to form larger rivers and, and, and lakes. What you see outlined in yellow is the Ipswich River watershed just to our north, and that's where both Beverly and Salem get their water from, and you're gonna hear a lot more about that in a talk by Rachel um, coming up next. For those of us who live in, Ma in Marblehead, uh, we've got a different source. We tap into the, uh, the water that comes through Boston that actually is, is originates out in central Massachusetts in the Quabbin Reservoir and through a series of pipes and tunnels is delivered all the way to Boston. But both of these are really high quality water. Um, really, for our, our uses, uh, you're gonna hear some, some issues that Rachel will bring up, but in general, they've been great sources of, of water for us in the long run. One thing I would note on here, we've got these nice straight boundaries around the edge of the state. Watersheds don't really follow that. So in general, most of these watersheds continue on beyond the state boundaries. And some of them, like the Connecticut River watershed, goes all the way up into Canada. So this will come up as an important feature when we talk about sort of regulations and maintaining water quality a little bit later. So once we've used the water and we now need to get rid of it, be it wastewater from our home, from an industry, sort of where does it go? We've got a number of choices, and these sort of numbered steps here sort of follow the increasing levels of technology. All of these have been applied here in Massachusetts. Number one, basically direct discharge, dumping it on the land or directly into a waterway really took place for hundreds of years, and it really wasn't until last the 50 to 100 years where we began sort of moving these things up, starting to use outhouses, um, septic systems, which began to treat some of the water at our specific locations like a home or a business. And then finally, we moved to what we call treatment facilities, where all of the water is piped to a facility and then it receives some level of treatment before it's released back to the environment. And we're very fortunate here um, in our three communities to be part of the um, SESD, the South Essex, Essex Sewerage um, District. Um, in, in addition to our three communities, Peabody and Danvers, as well as some portions of some of the surrounding communities, all of the wastewater from those communities is piped to a location not far from here, out on Salem Neck, where the water is treated to secondary level of treatment, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, um, before it's discharged back out into Salem Sound. Also on this slide, you see some blue arrows, and those are really representative of the storm water that falls just like today. We had a lot of snow melt. Well, a lot of that has to go somewhere, that water, and most of it discharges directly into our coastal waterway. And you're gonna hear a lot more about that from a talk that Maggie will give a third here coming up. So what happens at the SESD, the treatment plant? Um, it's a great facility. Um, you've probably driven by it a number of times on your way out to Salem Willows or to Winter Island, but you may have not noticed it, and I think that's the goal of every wastewater treatment plant is to be invisible, um, because oftentimes they're unsightly, oftentimes they have a lot of odors associated with them, and this plant does a really good job of, of managing all of that. Um, but the treatment it receives first sort of the, the coarser the, uh, particulate and the solids are screened out of the wastewater as it comes in. Um, there are biological activities that happen to it to chew up some of the nutrients and the chemicals that are in it. And finally, it's disinfected so that it's bacteria-free um, before it's discharged out into to Salem Sound. And a little bit of a chart um, that shows you the, the discharge from uh, an underground pipe that goes out into the harbor past Haste Island out in Salem Sound, again where that discharge takes place. So these things happen pretty much invisible to us. We turn on our taps, we get good, clean, fresh water, it goes down the drain, it disappears. 
Um, and we're very fortunate to have that be the case, but that really isn't how it's always been. It actually wasn't that long ago, and I think some of you in the audience might be old enough to remember some of these photos. This is the Cuyahoga River that runs through Cleveland, Ohio. Um, that back, oh gosh, going back well into the 1900s, would catch fire on a regular basis because of all the industrial discharges that went unchecked into this waterway. And there was a particularly large fire in 1969 that really captured not only the local attention there in Ohio, but folks around the country. And, and folks just like you who got informed and said some things really need to change, really did change that. Um, and what we saw happen in the 70s was the origin of the Environmental Protection Agency, the passage of a number of laws that preserve the cleanliness of our drinking water as well as our um, surrounding waters, the coastal waters. Um, and that trickled down to state regulations and local regulations, which in turn all work together. Because as I mentioned before in that watershed map where the watersheds don't know any boundaries. It's very important that we're consistent as we go from state to state, country to country, <laughs> that we apply the same regulations so that those of us on the downstream end are able to take advantage of good clean water as clean as it was on the upstream end. So we put this fire out. Uh, it took a number of decades. Um, figuratively to get all of these systems in place and we tackled those problems with discharges but we've got some new fires in this uh, particular era that we're in right now and you're going to hear more about that from the next couple of speakers um, one of them is I'm sure as you've walked on our local beaches you've seen a lot of debris that's washed up particularly a lot of plastics and it's so encouraging to hear the Cabot say that they're really working to remove single-use plastics from anything that happens here. That's, that's, a, that's a great initiative. Um, but in addition to these larger plastics that wash up and that you can see, there's a lot of microscopic things going on. There's micro, microplastics which end up going right through our wastewater systems. There are pharmaceuticals. There are a number of new chemicals that we've got to get our arms around, both at the federal level and at the state level. And this is a challenge for us going forward. Additionally, I know that you're all aware in terms of the effects of climate change. I've got a couple of shots here that, you'll, that will be familiar to, to you. Here's the Bass River back in the March of 2018 storm with a lot of flooding a day that it wasn't good to eat at the barnacle over in, in Marblehead. You certainly wouldn't want to pick the, the table by the window. And a day when the um, Derby Wharf really looked more like a reef rather than a wharf. And when we listen to the news, we often hear of the, there are global problems and it can oftentimes be overwhelming. What can I do to, to basically, you know, make a change for this? It, it seems, um, insurmountable. But um, I go back to the changes that we made 50 years ago and all the progress, and I listen to the words um, the chief scientist from the Nature Conservancy, um, Catherine um, Hayhoe, uh, really engenders it. She brings a very positive attitude, and she really focuses on what you can do locally. And the first step is to get informed exactly what you're doing here tonight. Um, sort of anything that you're interested, learn more about it. And the second step is to get involved. And through the next two presentations, you're gonna hear more about things that you can actually do to get involved. Any of our organizations, sometimes getting involved directly with the towns. Um, there are lots of organizations out there. And the third step that I don't think we always think about, but that she really emphasizes, is that um, it's important to talk about it. Talk to your neighbors, your friends, whatever. If you get impassioned about something, spread that word. And, and I really picked up on her confidence level that these are not insurmountable challenges. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Rachel, who's gonna bring it into the, um, the Ipswich River watershed, and I think come up with some sort of focused activities that you can take home in terms of, again, to begin to chip away at these, these uh, problems. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Steve. 
Um, next up, as Steve said, we have Rachel Schneider from Ipswich River Watershed Association, another amazing organization committed to keeping our local watershed clean, safe, and reliable. Rachel will speak to where our household water comes from and how we can impact its quantity. Let's give it up again for Rachel. Hello. It's so nice to be here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm from the Ipswich River Watershed Association, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that beautiful river where all your water comes from. Here is our watershed. So you can see the river starts way down in Burlington, and it flows northeast until it gets out to Ipswich and empties out into the Great Marsh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's a beautiful, very important ecological zone. And there are 22 communities that are either entirely or partially within the watershed, and then additional communities outside the watershed that drink Ipswich River water, including Salem and Beverly. The Ipswich River has been named one of the most endangered rivers in the country, and understandably so. The Ipswich has recently suffered from the worst two droughts in the river's hi history. <laughs> Sorry, John. So that was, of course, Special Climate Envoy John Kerry, who was kind enough to help us get the word out this past year that the Ipswich River is, was one of the 10 most endangered rivers in the country. Being endangered is not new for the Ipswich, but making the top 10 list uh, was definitely a wake-up call. Uh, so the river is actually one of the cleanest rivers in the entire state. So it's not a water quality problem, but as you can see, the river here. This is during the 2020 drought, which was a flash drought. It hit very suddenly. And this is an area in Ipswich where there should be a nice healthy riffle, which is very important for macroinvertebrates to breed, uh, which is very important for fish populations. So our river is kind of the poster child for Grant in our state, because when we get hit, we get hit hard. Uh, and the reason for that is threefold. So there is, of course, increased drought. We know that with the climate crisis, we're getting more stretches of intense heat, record-breaking heat, and long periods of having no precipitation. This graph here shows flow in the Ipswich River during the 2020 drought. So those triangles up there, that's the median flow. So that's where generally the flow level would be during that time of year for the Ipswich River. That by no means means that's a healthy flow for the river, it's just where it tends to be. That blue line is where the flow was. So you can see it is not anywhere near where it should be. And in fact, near the end of June, we had a record low flow for that time of the year for the Ipswich River. And that kind of drought really impacts the river long beyond when the drought happens. Uh, it impacts everything from the very, very small creatures, macroinvertebrates, we get fish kills because there's not enough dissolved oxygen in the water, and that takes a long time to bounce back from. So the other thing is, we have very old, out-of-date state water policy. When this picture was taken, we had the same water policy as now. Those kids are all grown up. They've graduated from college, they're about to graduate from high school, and sadly, even before they were born, we had the same water policy as we do have now. In fact, when I was born, we had the same water policy as we have now. And that was not, that wasn't recent. <laughs> <laughs> But the crux of the matter is we have excessive water withdrawals in the Ipswich River. So this was during the 2016 drought. This is Middleton's Reservoir, Middleton Pond, actually owned by Danvers. Uh, there should be water there. <laughs> and it's all gone. Uh, lots of fish kills in that pond. And every spring, this is not unique, every spring we see we get to mid-May and the water level starts dropping pretty rapidly in the wind in the river, and it's not like it completely stopped raining. We know that that's coming from water usage. Okay. 
Okay. So I'm going to backtrack here and look at the actual watershed and how hydrologically it should be functioning and how that's changed. So if we look at where we are, we are a deciduous temperate climate. So we have these nice deciduous forests, big broadleaf trees, very shady, very wet. If you've ever hiked on a humid day, I'm sure you know that. And those feed into all these beautiful water bodies that we love so much, our very clean rivers and lakes and ponds. So the two really need each other. So those forests really serve a purpose for watersheds. Uh, they're doing a lot hydrologically. They're helping water to infiltrate into the ground. They're keeping these areas um, from being washed away in, into rivers, so it's keeping very stable banks. And then there's a sort of reciprocation of water where it's, it's rising up, it's coming back down as it heat, hits the canopies. And much of the water that's being lost is just through evapotranspiration which is actually good for us because that's kind of like trees sweating for us. It makes it nice and cool. So that's not how things look now. We know that, of course, humans do change our landscapes. So this is an old map, but just from there you can see it's getting pretty crowded. <laughs> on the east coast of Massachusetts. And I would say that probably the North Shore has gotten much more into the orange now. Uh, in fact, in the North Shore, we have seen a boom of development since the early 2000s. It's really ramping up. And when you get more development, fortunately, you're getting more impervious areas, um, gray sort of areas, like parking lots, rooftops, and that creates the heat island effect which is just making those dry, hot days even worse. Also causes stormwater pollution, but Maggie will talk about that. So we've also lost a lot of forests. So those forests that are so important for keeping our water clean and getting it into our rivers and lakes and streams, we've lost a lot of those. I know I've grown up in Middleton, and the town that I lived in when I was six years old looks nothing like the town now. Uh, not just new developments, but I know a lot of wood land that no longer is there. There are houses there now. So, oh, we skipped a slide. <laughs> oh, no. Well, we'll forget about that slide. So all green spaces are not created equally. Oh, jeez. <laughs> all right. So in our climate, turf grass that's very well manicured, kept short, might as well be a desert. It's really not what's supposed to be here, and it's not providing any of those hydrological functions. And there are a lot of misconceptions about lawns and lawn maintenance. A big one being people think, well, I'm putting water on a plant, Whatever the plant's not using is going into the ground. And unfortunately, that's just not true with grass. Uh, they have very short roots, turf grass. Uh, they're pretty dense. Often people have to have their yards dethatched um, because otherwise it really can't allow that much infiltration. So most of the water that goes on lawns, especially with a sprinkler system, is just going to evaporate up. And that water is not coming back to us. It's going to go up in the airstream and blow somewhere else and probably end up in Florida. So it's a total loss. The other misconception is that you need to water your lawn for it to be green. But Bob has not watered his lawn, I think, ever. <laughs> and it's beautiful. And it's very green. And it only... It all it takes is naturalizing your lawn. So he's got various fescues, he's got clover, there's probably some moss in there. So with the right plants, you really don't need to do all of that lawn maintenance that commercials will tell you that you need every spring on HGTV. <laughs> okay. So, this is just not sustainable. This can't be how we're using our most important resource. 
we're kind of just throwing it away when we do this. But if we have really resilient communities that use water in a smart way and plan that we have plentiful, clean drinking water, we have, okay. <laughs> we have nice green areas that are good for pollinators and wildlife, and we have spaces that are healthier for our families and our pets. I always show the dog eating the grass because they do do that, and I always worry about them eating grass in places they shouldn't. So this is safe grass. He's just going to town. That's a happy dog. It must be really good grass. <laughs> We're just going to get nothing but this dog now. <laughs> this is the show now. We're just going to watch that dog. <laughs> Are we just going to watch that dog? What's happening? There we go. There we go. <laughs> so how do we get these water sustainable communities? And the answer really is all of you. We know that grassroots efforts are such an amazing instigator for change. And so we're really turning it around and asking our communities to trying to band together and say, this is what we want. We want communities that have enough water that we don't have to worry about our well or a neighbor's well going dry or hear about people having really gross water because their well levels went down and all these things are flushing out into their systems. We want a community where you can let your kid or your dog run on any piece of grass and not worry about what might be getting on their skin. Uh, and we want communities where we have lots of green, beautiful places. So we're hoping to achieve that lawn by lawn. <laughs> so this campaign is not only do you take a pledge to uphold the goals of the campaign, but also you're spreading the word by putting up these lawn signs and just letting your neighbors know this is something we want, this is what we do in this neighborhood. We've done studies that have shown that really what your neighbors are doing impacts what all the other neighbors are doing. <laughs> we definitely like to stick together. So the more of these signs we get up, the more likely we are to have communities that really hold to these values. And the goal is to save 3.5 million gallons of water per week, which sounds like a lot, but that is only 10 gallons per person for all the people who use water in, that belongs to the Ipswich River. Well, it's really not that much. And the pledge is, I will not water grass, I will hand water gardens, shrubs, and trees, and I will cut, up, cut out chemical use on my landscape and opt for natural alternatives. Yes. Yeah. Yay, they're all good things. <laughs> and we want this to be all over, so that's really up to you guys to make this catch on, and I just want to look at the map and see so many signs that I can't even see towns anymore. So thank you all so much. It's such a pleasure to speak to you. And next up will be Maggie from Salem Sound Coast Watch. Thank you, Rachel. All right, so let's all go plant extra clover in our lawns this spring. Yeah. Uh, that was amazing. Thank you, Rachel. We're going to give um, another moment for Jesse to give us a little ditty, and we're going to go ahead and welcome Maggie Tran. She's from Salem Sound Coast Watch. Maggie is sharing helpful insight as to where our household water goes and how we can impact its quality. So we'll welcome Maggie and then we'll all engage in a little conversation. Thank you. My name is Maggie. Um, I use the she, her pronouns. Um, I'm from Salem Sound Coast Watch. I'm a Salem resident. If you don't know who Salem Sound Coast Watch is, thank you for being here anyway. Um, we're a small environmental nonprofit right around the corner from all of you. Um, we do lots of 
in-school programming, out-of-school programming, as many events like this as we can, um, really just talking to anyone who will listen to us about our watershed and all the things that we can do, as Steve and Rachel have already mentioned, to, to protect that watershed. So I'm going to talk specifically about water quality um, here in Salem Sound. So as Steve mentioned, uh, a watershed is any area of land where all of the water in that area drains to the same major body of water. In our case, that major body of water is Salem Sound. Um, there should be a bright red arrow pointing to that big chunk of the ocean. We are actually a, a sub-watershed of the north, north coastal watershed, which goes um, farther north up to Gloucester and um, south of Marblehead out to Nahant. Um, all of these towns here, Manchester, Beverly, Danvers, Peabody, Marblehead, and Salem, all contribute all of their groundwater and stormwater to the Salem Sound um, embayment here. Um, it covers 166 square miles and is home to 190,000 people who use the water in that watershed and have an impact on it. All of the activities that we do at our homes, at our businesses, can impact the water in our watershed. So where does water go in Salem Sound? Uh, a number of places, depending on what we're using that water for. There are two built systems of infrastructure that we rely on to keep some water separate from one another. We have the sanitary sewer system and the stormwater system. As you'll notice in the diagram here on the right, the, all of that water trickling out of that urban area um, goes right into catch basins or storm drains right in the street and directly out into our waterways. So our favorite beaches are the ends of the stormwater system. The sanitary sewer um, is, handles all the wastewater from our home. So wastewater is anything that goes down our sinks, our showers or bathtubs, our laundry machines, our dishwashers, our toilets. Anything that leaves your home, leaves the Cabot Theater or schools or businesses, goes to the sewer system. As Steve talks about, all of our wastewater is handled by the South Essex Sewer District um, down by the Salem Willows. As he mentioned, you'll drive right by it. It's all very well contained. But it can handle up to 30 million gallons of wastewater per day. Uh, 180,000 people in the Salem Sound watershed and a little chunk of Middleton, a little chunk of Wenham, actually also send their wastewater to SESD. This is just a little snippet of the 29 miles of sewer pipes that are actually under our feet um, handling that wastewater. So just, um, you'll see here, and as Steve mentioned, the treatment plant now handles our wastewater water very well. Um, everything is filtered out. The discharge point there out in Salem Sound is very closely monitored by SESD staff making sure that it is properly sanitized and dechlorinated before it goes back out into the environment. In 19, prior to 1998, that was not the case. And they took out all the big stuff, made sure there wasn't any big floatables in there anymore, and then dumped it right back out into the sound. Gross. Um, so that was actually part of the inspiration for the inception of Salem Sound 2000, as we were called. Um, in 1990, that was when Salem Sound Coast Watch was founded. We thought, we're going to clean up this water. By the year 2000, our job will be done. We'll shut our doors. That'll be that. Um, 30 years later, here we are. The water is much cleaner, um, but we are definitely still, still keeping things clean and still checking on this and that. So um, there are, despite the complexity and the, the robustness of the wastewater treatment system, there are little things that we can do as residents and people who use the wastewater system to protect it and keep it functioning properly. A couple of those things being um, treating situations like this properly. So your bacon grease, your cooking oil, um, though it's hot and liquid in your pan, should go directly into the trash and not into the sink. These wipes, baby wipes, no matter how many times it says flushable, made from plants, will biodegrade, safe for your sewer and septic. Mm-mm. Don't listen to them. Um, especially when they compound on one another, when that baby wipe gets saturated with oils that you've dumped into your toilet or into your drain. 
um, can cause huge, huge, huge problems, not only in maybe your lateral right outside your door, but also at the pump stations in your community and at the wastewater treatment plant where that wastewater is moving um, at much higher pressures through much smaller pipes. Um, it can be a really dangerous and very expensive situation for everybody involved. So just skip it. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, the sewer and the storm drain are supposed to be 100% separate from one another. However, if defects in the pipes occur, whether they're from clogged pipes that we did by accident, or from pesky tree roots getting into our laterals and cracking those open, um, our wastewater can infiltrate into the stormwater system. Other contaminants that we need to, that we can maybe have more control over are things like uh, chemicals and soaps from washing our car or doing any washing outside, for chemicals and nutrients from fertilizers or pesticides that we use on our lawns or gardens, and pet waste, which is twice as high in bacteria as human waste. So all of those things compounded together make stormwater what we call a non-point source pollution, meaning even if we know what's in the water, we don't know exactly where it may have came from. We can't isolate it to one point. And polluted stormwater is the number one source of contamination um, in our waterways and at our beaches. So this graph here. Why is my beach closed? Uh, polluted stormwater runoff, you'll see that uh, pink chunk of the pie, is the most frequently identified reason um, for a beach closure. However, this purple part of the pie, the unknown, the 45%, just means that it very well could have also been sources from stormwater that they just didn't get directly from the stormwater pipe or from the outfall, as we call them, um, and could also be attributed to things that didn't start on the beach. They started in our front yards or in, in our lawns. So what is Salem Sound Coast Watch doing about it? Um, this is a map of our 30-odd sampling sites that we'll visit in a given year. Um, our first sampling project, which started in 1990 when we first started doing our thing, was the Clean Beaches and Streams program. And that monitored any coastal sites. We did a survey, so found every single stormwater outfall along the coast of Salem Sound. Um, and we monitor 15 to 20 of those locations to this day. Uh, we share that information with the respective communities. So, hey, Beverly, we were monitoring these sites. Here's the data. This is, what, this is how this is doing, X, Y, and Z. Um, in 2018, we extended our monitoring program to go upstream as well. Um, this one here. Can you see my cursor? No. So that one there, you, you probably know Beverly better than I do. Um, it doesn't have a picture associated with it, but that's Dane Street Beach. And in 2018, we added those five sites upstream of Dane Street along the Lawrence Brook. So we were finding a little contamination at Dane Street, and we sought to find out where it was coming from. Um, we monitor all of the sites for bacteria, for Enterococcus specifically, which is an indicator of sometimes wastewater infiltration or other sources of, of bacteria that indicate something's not where it's supposed to be. So what does the future hold? Stormwater issues exist now, and they will become exacerbated um, as our communities face climate change and, and other changes related to water. So increased rain, stronger storms, et cetera. This graph here shows um, the total amount of rainfall that the city of Boston experienced from the year 1960 to 2010. So that red line says that over the course of those 50 years, Boston has experienced five more inches a year of rain compared to 50 years ago. So that is only going to increase, especially here on the Northeast. Coupled with increased imperviousness, as Rachel mentioned, development in Massachusetts and, as in, and in the North Shore, as we've all been witness to, has skyrocketed around us. Um, and an impervious surface, so this imperviousness I'm talking about is the increase of surfaces that water can't pass through. Um, paved 
Paved areas, parking lots, driveways, sidewalks, and even roofs are considered impervious. Um, this graph here shows, compares two rivers, one that's in a, a vegetated or undeveloped zone, and, and that's the green line there, and the red line is a river, maybe the same river after it's been developed around. Um, the red line is in a developed area where there are impervious surfaces around it, um, structures, etc. They experience the same rain event at the beginning of the graph here, and then their response has shown the uh, flow rate, so how fast and how much water is in that river, and over time. So the vegetated river um, responds, the, it does get faster and responds pretty quickly and goes back to its base flow, but the red line you'll see immediately spikes up, and that's w where we would see flash flooding really inundated with, with water in our community and around that river, and then it skyrockets back down and goes lower than the vegetated river. So this river is experiencing really intense swings of high water conditions and dangerously low water conditions as well. So considering those things together, increased rain and increased impervious means, impervious Ness, um, will undoubtedly lead to more polluted stormwater. So those same issues that we're dealing with now could only become worse if we don't get a handle on them. Um, our beaches will continue to be closed because of the high amounts of bacteria that's left on our lawns and the excess nutrients that we're um, causing by using too much fertilizer on our lawns and gardens. We use it to help our grass grow, but if those same nutrients end up in a river close to our home or in the ocean, they can cause that same but much more harmful growth in other plants. But there are things that we can do about it. Um, namely, and most easily, just keep our streets clean. Pick up trash, whether it's yours or not, and prevent it from clogging up our storm drains and eventually making it to our favorite waterways. Picking up our dog waste, as I mentioned, it contains twice as much bacteria as human waste, and we wouldn't go leaving human waste on the ground, would we? So pick it up and throw it in the trash. It doesn't belong in our storm drains, which we unfortunately find a lot. Somebody picked it up, put it in a nice little bag, and then threw it in the storm drain. Um, not ideal. And then lastly, just use fewer lawn chemicals. So a great alternative to using um, high chemical fertilizers and pesticides is using compost. Um, it contains a lot of the same nutrients from your food waste. And lastly, I'll give you a few examples of some green infrastructure or maybe some larger steps that you could take to make your property a little bit more sustainable environmentally. So a number of things that you could do at home, whether you're a novice gardener or an expert, um, you could amend your soils, meaning make, th make them more prone to infiltration. When rain falls on your property, it stays on your property, is filtered there before it, is run off, before it runs off as stormwater and gets to the beach. You can do that just by amending the soils or maybe installing a rain garden with all native plants that don't need any fertilization, don't need any watering, um, porous pavement or open drainage are also doing the same thing. They're filtering that water um, before it gets into our stormwater system. And lastly, you can also advocate for some of these projects to be happening in your community. So maybe not in your backyard, but maybe at your elementary school or something like that. Um, for example, this in the bottom left-hand corner here, this is a detention basin that was installed and is in use at the Beverly Middle School. So any rain that falls at the Beverly Middle School is captured and held in this giant concrete tank here under the parking lot. It's held until it is slowly released into the Bass River as opposed to all of that rainwater being released into the stormwater system all at once. Um, Building a rain garden or having native plantings in big expansive parking lots is a great way to not only provide some stormwater uh, management, but is also a great community project. Um, this is a, the center picture here is a salt marsh, a salt marsh rain garden that um, Salem Sound Coast Watch installed uh, before my time, but um, on Commercial Street in Salem, and it wasn't intended to be a saltwater 
uh, rain garden, but when the North River got high enough and started flooding the rain gardens, it quickly became one. Um, and then the, over here on the right are two um, examples of porous pavement. So this walkway and this parking lot are paved with um, pavers that let the water go through the, the structure as opposed to rushing out the walkway or flooding that parking lot. And the last thing I wanted to mention, and it was on one of Steve's slides earlier, is if you want to know more about our water sampling or have questions about how the Lawrence Brook is doing or what the water quality is at your beach, um, this viewer called How's My Waterway is really, really cool, super easy to use. You can zoom into any of these sites, do a specific uh, search by a street address. You can see all of our data from all the way through last season, and any other agencies who are doing any monitoring, like DEP, um, that all of their data is, is there to see as well. So um, we use viewers like this one to inform our sampling each year. If a site hasn't been visited in many years, maybe it's time for a checkup or something like that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I had. A big thank you to Maggie for that presentation and all of our talented presenters this evening. Aren't we lucky? Yeah. Great. Um, so that concludes our presentation portion of the evening. We're about to transition into the panel um, that will be Q&A section, so I hope you're all saving up your questions. Um, Wooden Bone will be, will be entertaining us as we transition. For those of you who are on the panel, it's time to make your way up to the stage, please. Dean, Emily, Louise, um, Steve, Rachel. Am I missing someone? So you'll see some familiar faces, and then you'll see some other ones from some of the organizations that have or um, organized this evening for you. for wooden bone, bone, I mean. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you again to our panel, our speakers. That was really special and so informative. So thank you so much. I'd like to take a moment to introduce the, yeah, the taller for them. <laughs> so there are a few new faces, as Julia mentioned. So we'll just take a moment and have Dean, my coworker, introduce himself. I'm Green Beverly. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'm Dean, I'm the director of Green Beverly. And first of all, I wanna thank everybody for coming out tonight. I know that it's not always easy to set aside two, two and a half, three hours, especially on a weekday evening. So I applaud you and I, I really thank you for setting this as a priority, so thank you. Green Beverly, if you're not familiar with Green Beverly, is a nonprofit in Beverly. And we focus on working with various community organizations and partners like this um, to help us build a more sustainable community, to help us build a more sustainable Beverly in this case. And we do that through by providing information, education, events like this, by helping people to connect the dots to other organizations and business groups, I saw Rachel from Beverly Main Streets here somewhere. Um, we really look at involving the entire community and the different stakeholders in the community. And lastly, we provide a free coaching or consulting service. So if you have any questions about anything related to sustainability, whether it be water, 
home heating, transportation, lawn and garden, waste, etc. cetera. Uh, just go to our website. We have, I think right on the home page, we have a link to the coaching program and you can ask a question and we will link you up with one of our volunteer coaches that has expertise in that area. They can answer your question, depending on what it is, they may walk you through a process or hold your hand through a process. So I will uh, stop there and pass the mic to Louise. Thank you. All right, and this is Ms. Louise. Hi, so I'm Louise Yarmoff, the Executive Director of Sustainable Marblehead, and thank you very much for including Steve and I and Sustainable Marblehead tonight. Uh, it's really a thrill to be on stage in the Cabot Theater um, with you. We're a similar group to Green Beverly. We've been around for five years. Um, we want to create a supportive atmosphere where people feel like they can take action uh, in their own lives to address the climate crisis and not feel overwhelmed. We have six working groups um, which cover everything from biking to policy to energy supply and, of course, the harbor, uh, one of our more recently created groups. Um, some of the things we've done are worked on installing bike racks, water filling stations to reduce single-use plastic bottles in Marblehead. And last uh, June, we inaugurated Marblehead Ocean Week, uh, where we talked about clean boating uh, technologies and um, we installed storm drain markers in Marblehead to indicate that what you put in the storm drain drains directly to the harbor, uh, trying to erase awareness. Um, and we also have regular beach cleaning efforts and this uh, past, due to some of the storms, we collaborated with Salem Sound Coast Watch to deal with styrofoam that was washing up on the, both Marblehead and Salem shores after recent storms. So those are just some of the things we do. We also have a website, uh, which you can go to for more information. So thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Louise. Do you mind handing to Emily? Thank you. And Emily, could you introduce yourself as well? I will. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Flaherty, and I'm the Education Director at Salem Sound Coast Watch. And um, just a little bit more about Salem Sound Coast Watch, if you don't know us already. Um, we are in our 30th year, actually 30 too, we missed a celebration year because of COVID, so it's really nice to actually be out in the world again um, and see you all. So Salem Sound Coast Watch is probably most well known for beach cleanups, um, but we do a lot more. You heard from Maggie about our water quality efforts. We're also doing um, a fair amount of work right now with coastal resiliency, working with Beverly Salem and Marblehead right now with Marblehead most intensely. Um, just to, to make our communities more resilient in the, the light of climate change. Um, so there's a lot of work being done there. Um, we have um, big school efforts. Actually, we'll be next week in the Beverly Middle School doing our Keeping Water Clean program, which is part of a coalition um, between um, Ipswich River Watershed Association and... Um, help me out. The Merrimack, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission. <laughs> we are a stormwater collaborative, so between the three organizations, we provide stormwater outreach and education support to 25 communities on the North Shore. So our watershed, the Ipswich River watershed, and part of the Merrimack Valley as well. Maggie manages that program for all of our organizations. Um, that's a big role for her. And um, we also have big volunteering efforts. So if you ever want to get involved with monitoring invasive species, doing beach cleanups, Water quality monitoring, um, check out our website. We have a lot of projects going on and a very small staff, so we rely on volunteers and people like yourselves out here spreading the good word. Thank you so much. Do you want to hold the microphone for a moment? You don't have to change anything. So thank you all so much for being here. And as you all can see, there is no shortage of organizations in our neighborhood that are doing good in terms of climate in terms of climate resiliency. And so you have a bounty of resources here to sign up to volunteer, to learn more from. And speaking of learning more from, that's really why we're here for this portion of the evening is we'd love to get into a really robust conversation with you all about water. And so we've invited our panelists to the stage to engage with you all, as well as if there is anybody in the audience who potentially has something to share, and build on this conversation, would, would love to hear from you. So 
There's a microphone. Um, I thought Amelia, Amelia, do you mind standing up and waving to everybody where the microphone is, please? See, that's lovely Amelia, Green Beverly. Volunteer, thank you. Um, so if you have a question that you would like to ask or something that you'd like to start a conversation around with our panelists, please go ahead and walk on up to the mic. We'll give it a couple seconds. Maybe uh, Jesse's missing, so you don't want to hear me play the guitar. But um, yeah, we'll just give it a hot second. In the meantime, does anybody have anything they want to kick off as a question? No? We have a fine gentleman here. OK, great. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is David Mahood. I had a question about desalinization, because I've always thought of that as a last resort. Um, some negative uh, repercussions about desalinization plants. You said we have one here in the state. There's not a move to increase that. Is that really just out of desperation? Um, the one that I know of is in Taunton, and they use brackish water, so the less salty it is, the less energy that has to go into it. And I do agree that it's somewhat of a last resort, but where I see, um, particularly in the Middle East, where it's been coupled with is using renewable energy, particularly solar and maybe wind, so that you're not drawing energy from having to be a fossil fuel source. So it's a good question. Um, it's definitely a fallback. I know on the West Coast, some of California, those are areas where um, it's definitely implemented. But that's a great thing to keep in mind is hey, here's a technology that works, but what's the energy cost associated with it? When you're saying that too, Steve, something that comes up for me is often we have created what seem like good solutions but don't think about the negative effects of what some of those solutions down the line might have um, on unforeseen pieces. So that's something that comes up for me when you talk about the desalinization too, is like that seems like depleting our oceans. Is that better? Then, so it's interesting. Do you have a question? Hello, my name is Carol Bousquet. I'm from Ipswich, Mass, and I am a member of the Ipswich River Watershed Association. And I wanted to invite everybody here to become a member at $50 a year. Family, you can sign out a canoe or kayak from Riverbend in Ipswich and paddle seven days a week without even scheduling it. You just take your, <laughs> your, yourselves and your family out there for $50 a year membership. And it's a fantastic way to develop a relationship with any river. So I want to invite you there. I also want you to invite, uh, form a team and come help us out raising funds for the annual Paddleathon fundraiser, which is coming up. But I do have a couple of questions for Rachel, the um, expert. Um, Rachel, can you share with us two things? The importance of removing dams. And also, what is current legislation coming up that um, might be of interest to all of us here? Great. Thank you, Carol. I did not plant her in the audience, just so <laughs> no one up here believes me. <laughs> so dam removal is a very big thing for our river. Uh, there are three main stem dams, uh, meaning they're right on the actual main course of the river. And one of them is a head of tide dam. So these are especially destructive ecologically because they're right at that point where the tidal portion of the river is meeting the freshwater portion of the river. So this cuts that area off, which completely eliminates that transitional period, the freshwater tidal zone, which is very important uh, for fish species and other things where they need to have that slow transition from the freshwater into the salt water. Uh, and also it kind of ruins paddling. I would love to be able to put in at our headquarters and paddle right out to the estuary, but there's a dam in the way and you cannot portage around that dam. It's impossible unless you want to, yeah, darn the dam. <laughs> So that is something we really want to fix, especially because what we're looking at is herring numbers in our river just going down and down and down. It's an exponential problem. So herring return to their natal waters. So every year we get less herring returning. They don't spawn as much, and so less and less fish come each year. We do have a fish ladder, but most fish don't really like fish ladders and we've got the video proof of why. Uh, we have videos of otters just hanging out in the fish ladder, and if I were a fish, I wouldn't go up that death trap. 
And it's also kind of like walking up a hill against a headwind. Uh, so it's not very easy to swim up a fish ladder for a fish, and some fish can't even do it, uh, like shad. So we don't have shad in our river anymore because of the dams. So we are making progress with dam removal. South Middleton Dam is hopefully wrapping up the permitting process, and we'll see that come out. It was scheduled to come out in 2016. So I'm just I'm waiting. <laughs> and hopefully the Ipswich Mills Dam will move forward as well. Willowdale is still there, but it does have a fish ladder, and it's getting a new steep pass fish way, which is a better fish way. I'm imagining fish climbing up a ladder. <laughs> And I'm just curious what a fish ladder actually is. So it's, uh, it's more like a ramp, like a wheelchair ramp. So they, sh they should call it a fish ramp. That would be more accurate. Um, yes, let's, let's all start that now. We're the trend makers here. Fish ramp. <laughs> yes. Uh, and policy... So the big thing that's happening is, you may not know this, but in our state, about 90% of our water withdrawals have no regulations on them at all. There's no restrictions on them, even when we're in a declared drought. And that's true for the Ipswich River as well. So when we are in a statewide declared by the governor, if we're in a drought, there are still plenty of communities where they can water their lawns if they want to. Uh, many communities, private wells don't have any water restrictions, so they also, no matter what the conditions are, can use water how they please. And it seems like when we're in a drought, we should probably all agree to save water, but we just don't have that in place policy-wise. So we're hoping that the drought bill will advance. This has been going to committee, um, I think we're on the third time now, but it was finally reported favorably out of committee, and so it will go to the full legislature in summer. We're very excited about it. It's the bare minimum. This is going to say when we are in a declared drought, we have to conserve water, which seems obvious, but it's not in policy yet, but we're hoping to change that. So how can we all help with that? Is there? Yes, a please contact your legislators and let them know that this is important to you. And we just think that it's common sense to have that restriction in place and that we really want it to happen. Uh, and there are other things that will come up throughout the year, but that's, that's a big one. So to even dumb it down further, if you were to contract your legislator, what would that look like? So you can certainly send a letter or email, but honestly calling them is the best way to do it. So you can go right on MassGov. They have a really easy tool so you can find who your legislator is and just give their office a call and say, you know, drought bill, I can't remember what the number is, but if you email me, I will happily tell you what bill number it is. Uh, but they will know it as the drought bill because we've been talking their ears off about it. <laughs> so call them, tell them you want them to support it. Thank you so much, Rachel. We have another question. I think we've got time for one more after this. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Hannah Sinclair, and I'm a Beverly resident. Um, and I was noticing, well, the um, picture of the sewage plant, um, while you guys were showing the picture of the sewage plant, how close to the ocean it was located. Is there like any sort of contingency plan with it like getting flooded and like prevention of, of all that sewage water um, going out into our beautiful sound? Great question. Anybody know the answer? Do you want to, let me give it a step and then you add to it, Steve. We were actually just talking part. about this um, with climate change and the increased precipitation that Maggie was talking about um, and the fact that um, our sewer pipes will be under pressure and there will be infiltration into the sewer pipes. Um, and if people are pumping out their basements, their sump pumps go right into the sewer system. So there could be an increased um, flooding there, not just from sea level rise coming into the plant, but we're thinking of water um, coming through our pipe system into the, the sewage treatment plant. And so currently SESD, I believe, is working on a climate change adaptation plan. Um, but the problem is that they have gates that they can't control. So um, that water could potentially, potentially back up into our homes um, and that sort of thing. So I think it's, it's on the horizon that it will have to be addressed, for sure. Thank you. So 
because I'm not familiar with, if you could explain combined sewer overflows and sort of how many we have and sort of what's the status of those. Um, so the short answer is that we don't have any, um, at least in Salem, we don't have any. Uh, combi combined sewer overflow is um, basically outdated infrastructure from when all of our stormwater and all of our sewer water were in the same system. Um, that's a lot of water um, that easily and often overflowed the system, meaning that there's a, a valve, not an actual door that you open or close, but once the levels got to a certain height, they would just overflow into, into our waterways um, as a last resort, but it did often happen. We don't have any remaining CSOs um, in Salem. I don't believe there are any in Marblehead or Beverly either. Um, don't quote me on that, but I, I'm fairly certain that we don't have any um, remaining. There are some remaining in larger communities like Boston, um, Lowell, uh, along the Merrimack River. Unfortunately, that is a problem that they are still facing um, after large storms. Their stormwater goes into the same system and, and dumps right out into the Merrimack. So, um, yeah, they exist in our, in our state, but not in our community. Thank you so much. We've got time for uh, one, two more questions. Well, two more questions. Thank you. How you doing? My name is Christopher Suffalo. I'm from Gloucester. I was part of Governor Ed King's Corporation for a Cleaner Commonwealth. Back in 1981, we cleaned the Ipswich River, and it was absolutely dry. We had a canoe we had to pick up and carry. It was terrible, but there was a lot of pollution along the way. One thing we did with Governor Ed King, he sent us all around to dip to, uh, to Salisbury Beach. We went and picked up and, and we did some coastal cleaning. I'm just wondering, has the governor or any part of the state initiated any, anything? Thank you, first of all, for the efforts that you put in. That's great. I don't feel aware of anything in particular from the governor, do you? I don't know anything about water quality, although thank you for cleaning up our river. <laughs> and it's a big difference. Um, you used to not be able to clam in Ipswich at all, uh, but thanks to people who cared about the quality of the river, now we have world famous clams, so very cool. Uh, we are in discussion with legislators about water supply issues. Um, I mean, luckily the Ipswich River is now one of the cleanest rivers in the state. Uh, Merrimack is definitely struggling with the combined f sewer flow, so I know that's been a hot topic in the legislature. Um, is there anybody in the audience that feels confident that they can speak to this? Certainly, we're not the only ones with knowledge up here. Okay, cool. Well, was there one more question? <gasps> Gentlemen, family friendly event, hey. We have three more, excuse me. Um, this is my brother's Eli's question. Why do we have to pick up litter at the beach? That's an awesome question, Eli. <laughs> um, that's a great, great question, Eli. Um, so, unfortunately, seagulls and fish and lots of other animals are not quite as smart as you and me, and so you would know if you picked up a hamburger and saw a water bottle in it or a big piece of metal or plastic, you would say, no, thank you, that's not for me. But a bird or a fish can't, can't make that decision and sometimes they look exactly like their food. So the styrofoam that we are finding on beaches and most recently looks exactly like little, little fish eggs that birds were trying to gobble up. So we need to pick it up because they can't pick it up for themselves and they don't know the difference between food and plastic. Um, yeah, and it doesn't look very nice either, I would say. That's a great question, Eli and brothers. I would debate that we're smarter than seagulls, though. Would, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they are not, they're not putting styrofoam out on the beach, so. <laughs> great point. Uh, my name is Lorinda, and I'm, I'm, I don't like following Eli. Um, A little but, closer to the mic. Uh, I live here in Beverly, and in the past, I've taken some of my basketball kids, and we've um, stenciled on the storm drains near Lynch Park, drains to the ocean. So I wonder if 
there is a concerted effort to do that every so often because I don't think that's very visible, right? The, over the years, the stencils wear off. Um, so do you guys have a, like a cycle where that should be done <clears throat> so that people continue to be reminded that their storm drains flow right to the ocean? Yeah, it's a great, thank you so much for doing that. Um, you are hired to do that in, on the cycle that you determine. Um, so we actually love those, the stencils, we love the murals, we love the little plaques that Marblehead has installed that say drains to ocean. Um, you, but you're right, the, the murals or anything you draw on the pavement is not permanent. Um, so we encourage all of you, we have a million stencils, we can get a, some more, um, and we can lend them to you, we have all the equipment you would need to do that. Um, because the, prop, the pavement, sidewalks, and streets are DPW owned, you do have to mention to them that you're going to do that, um, but it is something that they want you to do, and they can write in their report that they send to the, D the EPA every year. That is a form of stormwater education. Putting that mural on that, on that roadway or in that park is a form of stormwater public education, and, and they need to do that every year. So they want you to do it. We want you to do it. Um, Salem Sound Coast Watch is a very small staff. They're, we are growing, but there's only five or six of us full time right now. So we can't always be the ones doing that, but we encourage, encourage all of you to do it. It's another awesome community or school project. Um, get a local artist involved. Um, our, we just hired a communication specialist who we hired as a volunteer, worked with first as a volunteer. She helped us made a, make a beautiful mural with a group of sixth graders in Salem. Um, but she's ours, you can't, you can't have her, so. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a really, really fun project and though not 100% permanent, can, can be tweaked and done again and again and that's fun too, so. Thank you, Maggie. You know, um, leading ladies, one of the co-founders of this series really um, understands that art is activism. One of their recent community conversations events here at the Cabot was actually on that exact topic. So it really reminds me that we can all find the ways in which, you know, sort of land for us as individuals to get involved and make change. And some of it's through policy and some of it's through going out with some paint and really um, putting our stamp on the, you know, the community. So thank you for that. Can I add one thing yes. to that? Um, just piggybacking on that a little bit, you could also adopt the storm drain right in front of your house and make sure that it's free of leaves and litter um, to help reduce flooding, but also to keep that trash out of the ocean. Hi, I'm Carol Gerard. I have a question about um, winter issues on road salt and snow melt. Are there any kinds of things that people can use that are not bad? <laughs> Oh, yes. <laughs> if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see all my fun little videos. Rachel on the river. But coffee grounds are actually what I use, and people think that they won't have enough coffee grounds, but if you start saving your coffee grounds, you're gonna see how much coffee you actually drink, and it's horrifying. <laughs> but if you don't drink coffee, many cafes will give their coffee grounds away for free, and they're great uh, as a substitute for salt. They get you the grit, just like sand does, but also because they're dark, they will help absorb the heat from the sun, so they actually will help that ice to melt a little bit faster. And what's really great about them is unlike road salt, and what you would put out on your steps. It doesn't go anywhere, so I think I put grounds out twice this year for the ice, and they just stayed there, and then the ice came again, and they were still there. So it works pretty well, and it's free. That's an awesome advice. Okay, thank you. Yeah, last question. Second to last question, excuse me. Thank you so much. I, um, I wanted to mention that there is a brand new task force on rivers working together, chaired by Senator Bruce Tarr. So this might answer your question, sir. Um, and they are, on that task force, there are legislative representatives from every town in the watershed. This is a brand new initiative within the last year to two years. And they are very hard at work, uh, and there are several pieces of legislation, brand new legislation working its way through uh, the State House now that relate to regulating the rivers and towns and, uh, you know, uh, usage, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so if you wanted to sign up for Rachel, I, I call it Rachel's weekly e-news, which is very succinct, but yet very effective um, every week and is one way to stay on top of all of those issues, including the legislative. They're never going to believe I didn't pay you to do that. <laughs> She's just very passionate and a great volunteer. I love it. Perfect. I'm Paul Willenbrock and uh, from Beverly, and this is the first time I've heard of Beverly Green, and I'm really glad to hear a lot of great information. And my question is, uh, is there a handout with this information that you've given? Um, like, I'd love to know more about my grass. I'd love to know, seeing where there's a, 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 a planting area that has the plants that you don't want to water. And most important, I'm going to put in two new driveways on my two family on top of Prospect Hill, and I would like to get porous driveway, okay? And I'd like to know Woo! where to get awesome. it. I'd like to know where to get it. So if you give me the information, I'd appreciate it. Can I start this, and then oh, Dean, I'll kick it back to you. Last thing, I'm a big, big senior center supporter at Beverly. Some of you kids should come out to the senior center and talk to the seniors about it more. Thanks. Thanks for calling us kids. Yeah. Love to. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Green Beverly um, had started about five years ago, but we really have been taking shape since last summer. Some of you may have seen us at the farmer's market. Um, we've got a pretty killer team of committed, passionate volunteers. And um, at the end of the day, one of the things that we're really passionate about is actually being the community hub for sustainable living. So we are working hard not to be the only individuals in town who know everything about everything related to climate resiliency. We really want to partner with and amplify the voices of the other organizations that are um, doing incredible work and creating those resources. So I'm going to kick it to Dean in a moment here just to let you know how you can find information. But again, um, a lot of the resources that this gentleman was just mentioning, um, we've not created. In fact, we're just, again, trying to amplify the voices of other great organizations doing this work. So, Dean, do you have anything to close on that? Not a lot. Our website. <laughs> you can go to our website. We have QR codes all over the front room and on our table that will bring you to our website, bring you to volunteer page, bring you to donating. Thank you. Um, so we can keep going um, and certainly introduce you to these other organizations also. Um, yeah, I'll just say one thing and then I'll let the other partners talk about the different materials that you have to offer as well. So on our website, we have a section called Green Actions where we've tried to really categorize different things that we can do in and around our homes, in a lot of cases, every day, on a daily basis. So check out our website and the Green Actions, and, um, and I'll let the other partners talk about some of the materials that you have. I think some is even here. Our websites are definitely key. Can I jump in here? Ooh, oh. Sorry, can I just quickly jump in that the Green Actions are, it's a living document. So when, when questions come in from the community, they will be updated. And uh, porous pavement is one of those that we want to kind of we want to keep up there. Um, so ask your questions. There are places where you can um, put questions into Green Beverly online. Um, you'll see us out and about at farmers markets and other places. Uh, we also offer workshops. We have a great team of coaches. So um, we we are about to close uh, our portion here. But if there's anybody else who's interested in, sh in sharing about this last question, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, to your specific question about projects and how do I learn how to do it and how do I learn more. We do have one um, very informative 16-page long little greenscapes guide, um, kind of a, a DIY guide to any, any garden project you were interested in doing, talk how to start composting, why to start composting, some native plants, um, X, Y, and Z. So definitely check that out. We have them up on our table and they are also online. Um, if you need a di digital version as well. We also have Greenscapes guides. <laughs> we made them together. <laughs> and I also have the lawn by lawn, lawn signs up there. So if you are interested in posting one in your lawn, thank you, and you can grab one. Uh, there's also some little fun things where you can calculate how much water you're saving, how much water you're collecting if you have a rain barrel. Uh, if you are interested in getting a rain barrel, we do do rain barrel workshops. I think the next one will be at Middleton Earth Day, which is on May 1st. So come by down 114, and I'll be there with rain barrels. And well, what else do we have? And you can read all about the river being endangered, which is sad but interesting. Great. There's also a QR. There are lots of QR codes floating around. So look for the one that says "Stay in Touch," and that's the one where you can go online and you can sign up for 
one or all of the organizations that are represented here tonight, they will keep you informed and they will be there to answer your questions. We will be there to answer your questions. Um, and I am going to wrap this up, this panel, and, and let's hear it for them. Let's give a round of applause for the panel. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and your, and your talent. Um, and thank you to all who participated tonight, whether you had um, a question or whether you had um, an answer or whether you were here as part of the audience to support and learn. Um, we really, really appreciate this. I appreciate you being here. And Coastal Communities Talk Water, I would say, is a pretty big success. Let's hear it. Thanks for showing up. So as the program winds down and... Um, and our panelists make their way back to their seats. Uh, we'd like to take a moment to recognize the volunteers who are here tonight. If you would stand up, if you're a volunteer, so that we can congratulate you and, and, and thank you. We also have um, a couple more thank yous and then we're gonna do the raffle, so don't go anywhere. Um, just wanted to, to thank, quickly, Steel Root for the entertainment, um, Mortgage Network for the free adult meals, Root for all the, food, all the food tonight, and they've sponsored the kids' meals. Um, the Cabot provided free filtered water. Salem Sound Coast Watch um, offered and uh, provided the kids' activities. Um, and then Salem Plumbing and Supply provided the, donated the, um, the grand prize tonight for the raffle. So, we are going, well, let's hear it for all those sponsors. They really did pull this together for us. So we're going to pull the raffle, but before we do so, I just want to invite you to stay to listen to a little bit more of this beautiful music, continue eating, socialize, check out the organization's tables, and above all else, connect with your community members as long as it feels right for so you. So the raffle Thank comes so now, much. or the raffle comes now, and then we'll have the music and more exactly. socializing, okay? Thank you. All right. All right. So let's see. We have four packages this evening, the first being our Ocean Pride package. And we have a handy dandy little app that pulls a randomized number. And we are going with number 14, which is Will Sprecker. Do you happen to still be in the audience, Will? Yeah. Oh, Will so you don't have to come up here, if, but if you can meet us in the lobby at the raffle table afterwards, that would be great. And that goes for the other three. So congratulations, Will. You're welcome. Great, so the second package is the River Pride package. We are touching the handy dandy button here, generating, and the number is 12. Whom is? Uh, Anthony. Anthony Boff. Are you still here, Anthony? Hey. Anthony, hey, hi. You have the River Pride package. We should write this down. Um, I know. Okay. <laughs> Anthony, your river, just think river. Will, you were ocean. Okay. And then, our Save Water Drink Wine, which sounds like a good time, uh, is Rita Thompson, my buddy. Rita, you win the Save Water Drink Wine. I'll be having some wine with you. <laughs> Thank you, and you're welcome. And our grand prize, drum roll, please, which it works. Okay. Everything but the kitchen sink. Lucky number seven is Lucy Fry. Okay, all. Thank you so, so much for being here for keep Coastal in, Communities Talk Keep Water. enjoying yourselves. Yes. And uh, if you want a surprise, I want a surprise. A surprise prize. <laughs> Come find us and we'll help you uh, get it. Thank you. Thank you, you everyone. <laughs>